So this lecture is about research methods, a little bit about histology or the, or the, the cells of the nervous system. It's about imaging and it's about stimulating the brain. Boy, there are some revolutionary things going on in neuroimaging, in histology. It's just amazing. Um, and so we're going to have, I think this, this lecture is going to be uh, pretty interesting and probably outdated in about a year because there's so many things going on. Okay, so let's start with a, just a simple scientific method. You know, uh, there was a quote that I kind of liked. I think it was John Watson that said this, but I'm not 100% sure. He said, I treat psychology as a science in hopes of helping her become one. You know, John Watson was a behaviorist back uh, in the 19, early 1900s. Um, well, whether he said it or not, it's still a great quote. And so I think we should understand just some basic ideas about the scientific method. And there are different versions of this method, and so I'm gonna give you sort of the version I got and, and I kind of like. So the scientific method solves a lot of problems. Um, we cure cancer and we discover great things by following this method. So it begins with the idea or philosophy of empiricism, the idea that we can look at, through science, what we can gain by our senses. So we can't really, as scientists, talk about angels or, or mis mystical creatures. We have to stick with what we can see in the physical world. So we begin our process by looking at the physical world, looking at nature. Um, and from our observation, maybe we're interested in animal behavior and we observe animals doing something or we observe human behavior or we observe imaging. And from that, we can create a hypothesis. Now, hypothesis comes from observation. A hypothesis is a testable prediction of how you think the world works how a behavior happens, what causes this thing to happen on a neuroimaging, why people take gambling risks, whatever. You make a hypothesis and you make it in the way that it is testable. That's not easy to do, a testable hypothesis. So it's not a question, it's a prediction, okay? And finally, we do an experimentation um, where we're testing the hypothesis, and experimentations aren't easy because there's always confounding variables and things that get in our way. And um, so, creating a hypothesis isn't isn't easy, but you have to make one that is testable in a lab under reasonable conditions. So, in an experiment, there's typically a part that you might manipulate. Let's say you're interested in how a certain drug affects the symptoms of depression. You might give, as a doctor, different concentrations of the drug, okay? You could give a placebo, which has nothing, 5%, 5 milligrams of the drug, 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams. Those manipulations are your independent variable. Your dependent variable are what you measure. So you might measure if the symptoms of the depression go away, if they go away in different groups, if the symptoms of depression go away in the group that got the sugar pill, which is the placebo, it has nothing in it, in the same way as the 15 milligrams of your drug, eh, your drug's probably not working, right? So a control groups oftentimes uh, might be something like um, getting a, a sugar pill or uh, w which doesn't contain the thing you're interested in. So oftentimes, but not always, you have control groups and you compare your experimental group that has the different levels of an independent variable, such as 5 and 10 milligrams of an antidepressant or what you think is an antidepressant and a control group. And you compare the two of them on dependent variables. There's a lot of dependent variables, and you might look at dependent variables of where certain areas of the brain are lighting up in an imaging study, or whether an animal uh, presses a lever or is scared of a stimulus or whatever. It's what you measure, and you want to be as accurate as you can about that, and you also want to do your best to ascribe uh, quantifications and statistics to your dependent variable. Psychology 
as it at by its nature, you know, it, it is prone to subjectivity. So we interpret what we see because we're looking at very complex things, complex behaviors. A quantification and statistics can help reduce those experimentations. You might also have a situation where you as the experimenter don't know which group is getting the, the levels of your independent variable. That's a blind study. It's really important. Okay, so experimentation follows or is created to test your hypothesis. The, ex the dependent variable, the measurements might support your prediction, support your hypothesis, or they may fail to support your hypothesis. Fourth, we bring all of our data together. We look at how those data apply to the hypothesis. We look at other people's research in the context of our own research, and we theorize. We make, um, we create theories of how we think the world is working, how drugs are working, how brain images are telling us about different parts of the brain, how animals' behavior is happening because of associative learning. Theories in science are not whims. They're not, oh, hey, I had this great theory about something. No, theories are well supported by evidence. So we have the theory of natural selection to explain the evolution of animals. Tons of support. We have the theory, uh, theories of uh, global climate change. Tons of support for that. So we create these theories that are really well supported, but also keep in mind, theories modify, theories change. New evidence comes in, we might look at an old theory and say we need to modify it, okay? So science is very dynamic in that way, in that we can alter the way we look at things. And sometimes the best research doesn't really answer questions, but creates new questions, tests a theories. Test how well a theory predicts future behaviors or future uh, outcomes in terms of neuroimaging in the brain. Right? Theories are really important uh, in the scientific method, and, and again, they are well supported. And finally, one of the most important parts of the scientific method and science in general is replication. We need to be able to repeat the things we find. And this can be, depending on who you talk to, can be difficult in psychology. Sometimes we have problems with replication. And maybe we look at, um, we use meta-analysis. We look at uh, uh, maybe a hundred, a thousand different papers, journal articles that are trying to deal with the same thing to look for trends. Because sometimes, because psychology and neuroscience is so complex, there's a great deal of variation from one experiment to the other in terms of what we find. So replication is really, uh, really important, and it's become more and more important in neuroscience. Okay, what about animals in research? Well, we have this principle, it's called the general process approach. And it's the idea that genetics, physiology, learning, neuroscience, a lot of the basic principles that govern how these things work are the same across many animals. For example, the genetics that are in you, your DNA, is very similar to a DNA of a rat or a DNA of a slug. Now, we both have the same sequence of, we both use adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine. These are, these are the DNA bases. We just put ours in different order, but they follow the same rules. Genetic and inheritance follow a lot of the same rules. So we can learn a lot, for example, about human genetics by looking at fruit flies because the rules that govern genetics are very similar between us and fruit flies, and fruit flies breed really, really quickly, and we can look at those kinds of things. But it's the same at, with learning principles. It's one of the things that I worked on a long time. I studied basic associative learning principles that could be generalized to a lot of animals, and I looked at a honeybee, right? So also, you know, it, the neurons in you and the neurons in a rat are the same. Right? They use uh, neurotransmitters the same way. They use action potentials the same way. It's just maybe the organization and the complexity. So the idea of the general process approach is we can use animal models to learn a lot about other animals as well as humans. Most often, the animals used in um, research in neuroscience are rodents, like mice. 
and rats and guinea pigs. And, um, you know, they're easy to breed. They're easy to control. They're, they're, there's a lot of great protocols out there for keeping them in a lab. Oftentimes in, animal, in uh, learning research, we use uh, birds like pigeons. I used, uh, in some research, I used a starling, which is a, which is a bird. And the great things about pigeons is they eat a lot, so you can reward them constantly. And they see color, whereas rats have very limited color vision. So there's a lot of other things you can do with pigeons. But you can look at basic principles of how humans and other animals learn by looking at these animals. So in genetics research and in research on neuroscience, um, we can use thing, uh, animals that have their genes modified. So we might have a transgenic mouse where we insert genes. This is the great thing about having the same DNA as a fruit fly. We could take a gene out of a fruit fly and stick it into a, a mouse. The mouse on the right there, it glows in the dark. It's a glow in the dark mouse. And what the scientists did were they found the section of the DNA that produced a protein that was bioluminescent and glowed. And they found this in the jellyfish and corals. And they were able to take that DNA and put it into another animal. And now that animal glows. There are glow in the dark uh, dogs and pigs and even primates. They've made some glow in the dark primates. And of course, you can buy a glow-in-the-dark fish, a transgenic fish, in many pet stores. Sometimes we want to remove a gene. We want to knock it out. And these are really important animal models for research because maybe we knock out this little gene and we find that the animal starts producing uh, certain types of brain proteins that are closely related to Alzheimer's. And now we have a, 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 a rat or a mouse that is, an, is a model for Alzheimer's. And we can do research on what might help people with Alzheimer's by using this model mouse. And there are a number of knockout mice um, that are used for um, uh, food and hunger and thirst and diabetes and, and all sorts of things. And as I mentioned before, I used to work with honeybees and invertebrates are a very popular animal to use in neuroscience. In fact, Eric Kendall won a Nobel Prize for his research in medicine on how neurons work. And I talk about that in a different lecture. And he used a sea slug something called an amplesia, because it had a really simple nervous system. But its nervous system, its neurons, worked very similar to how other neurons, uh, other animals' neurons work. So I use bees, people use flies, flatworms. There's a flatworm called the C. elegans, used all throughout neuroscience. And these are good ways of investigating neuroscience by using really simple um, animals with simple nervous systems. Humans have 86 billion neurons. You're going to really track all those? No, I don't think so. So invertebrates are a popular animal in neuroscience now. There's a lot of work on live animals in, in research in neuroscience where we can manipulate or uh, affect specific parts of the brain and look at changes in the animal's behavior. Okay? And this is usually done in a field called physiological psychology. And when you are working with live animals, it's called vivisection, live animal research. So we might stick an electrode, guide it very specifically to a specific area, and that electrode could lesion or destroy a very tiny part of the animal's brain. And we can look for changes in behavior. So you might put an electrode way down into the hypothalamus, into a very specific area of the hypothalamus, and if you lesion that area, suddenly you find the animal um, maybe eats a lot of food or doesn't have an appetite and doesn't eat or has problems with gro growth or sexual reproduction or something. And that can tell us and that can help us map out the brain, right? So microelectrodes are placed in very specific areas. You can also stick what's called a cannula into an area of the brain. And instead of lesioning that area, um, it might put some uh, very specific neurotransmitter 
down into that area or a drug of some sort. Let's say it, you can put a, a little drug that might uh, affect um, an animal's uh, anxiety and, sh and we can look at fear responses. You can put in neurotoxins that, that are taken up by the neuron and kill very specific neurons. Okay, these are very precise ways of looking at animal behavior and the brain. And then there's microdialysis. Again, you're, you're placing something in the brain very specifically, but this time you're drawing things out. If you want to know what neurotransmitter is uh, affecting drug addiction, you might record, uh, take a, a microdialysis probe, put it down into an area of the brain that you think is involved in addiction, and you find when the animal is pressing a lever to get, for example, a cocaine, you're finding a lot of dopamine being pulled out or being active. So a microdialysis can test very specific fluids from different parts of the brain. So how do you get these electrodes and cannulas and probes to very precise, micron level precision into the brain? Well, one of the techniques is called stereotaxic surgery, where the animal's head is, is affixed in a very specific part, and then you can guide very precisely where these electrodes or these cannulas go. Sometimes we can, use, we can have computers guide them for you uh, in a research lab. Um, stereotaxic surgery is used not only in research, but in medicine as well. Let's say somebody has a cancerous growth in the brain. You, it's the same thing. You secure a person's head in a very specific area and you guide uh, electrodes or needles or something to exact locations in the brain to try to, um, to, try to destroy that, that tumor. Now, if you're interested, for example, of what happens if I lesion this very specific part of the hypothalamus, and you say, well, I'm getting all these changes in behavior, it must be due to that part of the brain being lesioned. Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's just the fact that this animal had all this surgery, and uh, the surgery caused the, caused the behavioral change. So oftentimes in stereotaxic surgery, tactic surgery, you have another animal, a control, that has the exact same experience in every single way. The surgery, the anesthesia, the electrode being stick, stuck into an area of the brain. You just don't lesion that area. You do everything the same, but you don't do that level of the independent variable. You don't put chemicals down there with a cannula. You know, everything the same except for that one smart thing. And then you look for that animal's behavior. And so let's say you have uh, two rats and you, you, you want to lesion an area of the hypothalamus called the arcuate nucleus. So you guide a, a microelectrode down to that area, that tiny, tiny area of the hypothalamus, and you lesion it. And then you do the same for the sham control, but the electrode gets to that spot and doesn't lesion. It just is removed. Now both animals have the same experience except for the lesion part. And you find one that was lesioned, it starts having different appetites and eating, wanting different foods and, and getting fatter, and the other one doesn't. So you know it's what, what the manipulation you did changed the behavior. Another thing that you have to be extra careful about when you're doing this type of research is you need to have evidence that the cannula or the electrode or the lesion took place in exactly the place that you thought it did. This is difficult research. So oftentimes with this research, the rat is euthanized and the brain is removed and it's affixed. It's frozen or it's affixed in some way and then it's sliced right? Slice like a meat slicer. It's kind of gross, but it sliced extremely thin slices. And each slice, you look at or take a picture of that slice. And you know, because you have a good map of the brain, that when you get to the slice where that part of the hypothalamus was, you can see that lesion. You have evidence that the electrode went where you thought it went. So microtomes are, are slices, very, very thin slices of the brain. It often follows uh, 
uh, stereotaxic surgery research. Okay, finally, neurohistology. Histology is the study of tissue, uh, the study of, um, so you might have histology study of the liver tissue or skin or pancreas. Neurohistology is the study of tissue of the brain. So you're looking at neurons or you're looking at glial cells, but in this case, you're looking at neurons. These are pictures of neurons. And the, this one down here is actually a very large pyramidal neuron and it is stained with what's called Golgi stain. And, and what happens is if you were to look at all the cells here, they're just all clumped together. All the cells are just clumped together. You couldn't see the tissue. And Golgi uh, along, so this Golgi stain procedure is potassium dichromate and silver nitrate are not taken in by every single cell. They're only taken in by a few and they dye the cell dark black. And so Camille Golgi, way back in the 19, early 1900s, came up with a way of staining only a specific cells and saw that the cells had all these dendritic branches and these axons that come out and the axonal branches. Santiago Ramon Cajal was a really interesting guy. You should look him up. He's great. Because not only did he work with, uh, with Golgi on these staining methods, but he was an artist and he loved drawing the things that he saw. So this is a drawing of his showing the incredible dendritic branching from a Golgi stain. All right. Okay, and there's different types of staining, modern staining techniques. This is a nissel stain right here to the right in purple. And this stains areas, purple, uh, uh, where there's a lot of protein synthesis in the cell bodies. So it shows you where a lot of cell bodies are. And what's interesting about here is we're looking at a cortex and this light pink, light purple area, you have a lot of axon axons, myelinated axons moving through here. So there's not a lot of cell bodies. The cell bodies are in the gray matter on the cortex. So this stain finds all those and turns them purple. So this shows you where a lot of cell bodies are located. Green fluorescent protein, we saw an example of that earlier with the glow in the dark mouse. And this is a way of putting in proteins that glow. And it's a way of staining neurons by how they glow. And one of my favorite ones is a, is a technique in an animal called brainbow. Isn't that great? It's rainbow, but brainbow. And what they're doing is they're using green fluorescent protein techniques, but they're altering the colors. It's called a Creelox combination method. That's a little too detailed for this. But they're able to have these, pro these uh, proteins go in to uh, different cells and change color depending on the, the sort of random combination of these uh, different components. And what happens is you get, you get cells that have different colors on them. So let's look at one here. This is such a pretty, this is Brainbow here. It's a genetically modified mouse. And you can see that these all glow. And this is an area of the brain called the hippocampus. And so some of the cells took up and turned green and some turned blue and some turned pink and some turned red. I think there's about a hundred possible colors that it can create. Really interesting way of staining brain tissue. It's also really pretty. Okay, and finally I'll just talk about immunostaining. And in this case, you're attaching a stain, uh, a color, a fluorescent, to a vector like a, a virus. And the virus infects neurons, different neurons, and attaches that protein or attaches that gene into that cell, making those cells different color. You could even attach something like a radioactive element that can be traced. Now, these are viruses that aren't causing a disease. They have been modified so that they're only carrying and infecting with these stains. And you can get different stains depending on what you're looking for, what protein, what specific protein is in those neurons. So some 
neurons have a different protein in them and they might turn red because of what you did or some turn green. Um, and this is, a, this is a wonderful new way of staining and as well tracing. So now what we wanna do, because neurons are long or sometimes they're short, Sometimes the axon stretches across the brain. Sometimes the axon just goes a millimeter to the right. You wanna know not just what areas of the brain are involved in different things, but you wanna know how neurons are connected, how they're connected to a lot of other neurons, where they send their signal, where axons go. And this technique is, or these techniques are known as tracing, tracing where neurons go. Now you can have an anterior grade tra tracing. So you inject some tracer molecule, some detectable molecule, something that's colored or bioluminescent or radioactive and you put it into the cell body. And then you go looking for where this, this chemical ended up because it was moved down the axon. And this molecule is transported along the um, along the axon and it gets to the terminal end and then you go and you search and you say, well, I found this same chemical three millimeters away at this other structure. Obviously, this structure is communicating with that structure because there's neurons that connect the two. Really important um, research right now in better understanding and mapping the brain. Antigrade starts at the cell body and then you look where it terminates, but there's also retrograde tracing. Well, if I'm at a, an area of the brain, let's say I'm at the periaqueductal gray down in the midbrain, and I'm like, well, what is innervating? What is connecting to this area? So I might add some kind of tracer to the periaqueductal gray that gets into the terminal boutons, gets to the terminal ends of axons, and is pulled back to the cell body and tells us where the cell body originated. Uh, there's a whole bunch of versions of these. One is horseradish perioxidase. So I might put a little horseradish perioxidase in the periaqueductal gray, and then I find it in the central amygdala. I'm like, okay, cells from the central amygdala are sending their signal to the periaqueductal gray. So again, anterior grade, put the chemical here, look to where it ends up, and retrograde, put it at the end and follow it backwards. Follow it backwards. Put it in there and follow it backwards to the cell body, okay? All right, let's look at some recording methods. Now we're getting into some other methods of, of doing research. So there's psychophysiology, and that's kind of what we're talking about here. We're talking about recording the body. We're not um, doing vivisection into animals' brains. We're not doing slices of tissue. Uh, this is most often non-invasive. And we're gonna look at some non-invasive ways of looking at the physiology and the activity of the brain when doing research. Well, one simple one is just electrocardiogram, an ECG. It used to be called an EKG, because that's German, whatever. And this is just measuring heartbeat. And your heartbeat can adjust depending on the environment. So if you're watching a scary movie and all of a sudden the, the big scary clown jumps out, your heart rate will elevate because of this psychological experience. Now, uh, another thing that has gotten a lot of attention lately is what's called heart rate variability. So the beats between each heartbeat, these are different named different waves, the P, Q, R, S, T wave, and the distance between one beat and the other is an interval. Well, sometimes that interval is very consistent. Beep, 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 beep. And sometimes it's variable. Beep, 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 beep. Heart rate variability can tell us a lot about the health of the heart and, and uh, the, the health of the person, but it's also been shown to when you have greater variability uh, people tend to do better athletically. People tend to perform better athletically. People tend to handle stressful events better when the variability increases. And this has a lot to do with how the parasympathetic activity, which affects heartbeat, 
and tends to affect heartbeat very quickly. And sympathetic activity, which is the, I'm really scared, and that tends to react to the, uh, affect the heart just a little slower. They're, they're innervating the heart in different ways. So just this measure of ver heart rate variability might tell us a lot about the individual um, in terms of their anxiety levels, their stress levels, how they're coping mechanisms, whether they're attending to things. So we're doing a lot of heart rate variability in my lab right now. And then there's electrodermal activity. I love Jordan Peele, it just cracks me up. And this is just a measure of sweat. Now it's typically not measured like this, it's typically me measured just from the fingertips. But if you're aroused or stimulated, you get a, just a tiny, tiny little bit of sweat on your skin. And if you have a very sensitive EDA machine, so this is, by the way, it has a lot of names, galvanic skin response, skin conductance levels response, whatever. It's measuring perspiration at a very, very um, tiny amount. So if you are in a research lab and you show somebody a picture of, uh, of a scary snake, you're gonna get electrodermal activity recorded, I don't know, about four seconds after they see that thing. But it might also tell you a lot about whether they're making good or bad decisions and, and, and other things. We use this a lot in our lab on studying decision theory, right? Electromyograms are great. That's uh, testing muscle activity. You use electromyograms all over the body, oftentimes in sleep studies. We use it in our lab on the face. We put electrodes on, on the face. And you can see here, up right in here, right above the eye, there's a, a set of muscles called the corrugator muscles or corrugator supercilii. And these EMGs are measuring the tiniest twitch in muscle activity in this muscle group. This is a little, the, up here is uh, probably the ground. Um, and so even the micro expression of activity here tends to correlate with people that are angry, upset, fearful, or disgusted by whatever they're viewing. Um, and then, so this is, tends to measure negative emotional responses. If you put the electrodes here, uh, along some muscles called the zygomaticus, these tend to twitch slightly when you're happy right? A little, little smile, and we get that. So if we have a lot of activity here in the zygomaticus, people tend to be, whatever they're doing, just a little bit happier. If we have higher, higher activity here, we tend to say, uh, they're not so happy. Brain scans have received a lot of attention lately uh, in telling us what's going on in the brain. Now, we can have simple x-rays. You've probably all had x-ray, x-ray of teeth, uh, x-ray of limbs, broken bones, right? And these are just um, the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that passes through tissue and tends to be absorbed by some tissue and goes through other tissue and that creates an image. If you do a lot of x-ray scans and you use a computer to kind of put them together, you can get more detailed scans and sometimes even three-dimensional scans or different... Um, different angle scans, and those are put together in a CAT scan, or CT scan, they're sometimes called, or CAT scan, and they're using computers, and sometimes they also use dyes, contrast dyes, to highlight certain things because an x-ray won't go through these dyes in the same way, and you can trace uh, different pathways of blood. So here's a picture of a CAT scan. You can get some pretty good detail there. There are the ventricles, and there's a la longitudinal fissure, and this is a pretty good scan. This looks like a horizontal scan to me. Okay, and, and another way of doing research is looking at brain activity in terms of neurons firing synaptic activity. Those are putting off electrical charges. And you can measure that using what's called the electroencephalogram or electroencephalography, EEG. And you place electrodes at different parts of the brain. So if the electrode is placed here, these are the frontals, these are the centrals, this is the temporal, occipital, and parietal. And you're primarily measuring activity of the cortex. Although there are mechanisms to use EEG to look at deeper activity, but it tends to be more cortical activity. What's nice about EEGs um, for several, EEGs are great for several reasons. One, they're pretty cheap. 
as brain scans go, usually colleges um, can afford them, right? You might get a setup for $10,000. That's a lot of money, but it's not an MRI, you know? And the people can move around a lot, so you can do stuff with children, do research with children. Look at that cute little baby with the, with the um, EEG cap on there, or net, as, the, as this one's called. And also EEGs give you real-time activity of the brain. So we're not waiting for everything. It's, it's almost real-time research and, and some pretty good stuff, especially because the cortex is so involved in cognitive psychological processes. It makes for a good instrument in a psychology department. So in EEG, you could record continuously looking at brain waves so if you have a lot of desynchronization of brainwave neuron activity, you get these beta waves. Hopefully while you're listening to this lecture, you got beta wave activity. And then as the brainwave synchronized a little bit more, you get alpha waves and theta waves and delta waves. If you are listening to this lecture in theta, you're probably falling asleep. I'm trying to wake you up here. Delta, you're definitely deep in sleep. Theta is a, a, is a deep relaxation oftentimes first stages of sleep. We'll talk about that if you know, I have another lecture about brain waves. Um, or you can look at brain waves that are time locked to an event. So you show them an image, you have them press a button, they do something. And then every time they do that, you get a series of waves that happen right after well, just before they press a button or just before they expect something. And then after you get these brain waves that are called event related. Well, because there was an event and these brain waves are related to that event. This came from my lab. I have an EEG in my lab. And this is known as the P300 positive. Positive is down, negative is up, right? And this is 300 milliseconds after an event. We had them say something here, or they, we had them look at something. And then three milliseconds after, we get this deep brain wave. And you can see this brain wave depending on frontal activity, central activity, or parietal activity. And we could look at these brain waves, and the amplitude of those brain waves can tell us a lot. Let me give you one quick example. Uh, if I showed images like this, I showed an X, the letter X. And I showed it over and over and over again. X, 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 O, X, 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 O. Every time the O came up, that was different. We call that an oddball. And every time there was something different, you'd get a deeper P300 wave because it doesn't really meet expectations. And it's almost like the brain has to go, hey, wait a minute. Whoa, wait. Let's spend a little bit more effort thinking about what I just saw. So there's a whole bunch of these event-related potentials that can tell us about whether people are, make good decisions or bad decisions or make errors and, and, and a whole bunch of things. Okay, now we get into the expensive stuff. Magnetic resonance imaging technique, and there's a, a little GIF over there on the side, and um, these use really large magnetic fields that line up the spin of protons in molecules. These magnetics line them up, such as water or oxygen. When the magnets turn off, all the protons realign, creating kind of a radio wave that can be detected. In other words, you can tell where oxygen is or where water is or where certain tissue is all by this magnetic field that shuts off and sends off these, these very little uh, waves. And so if you're in an MRI, if you've ever had an MRI, they make a lot of noise because they're going boom, 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 boom. And those are, those are the, magnetics, uh, the magnetic fields turning on and off. Um, this is really good for looking deep down the brain and making 3D images of the brain. And it's really expensive, so you're probably not gonna find this equipment at, at most colleges, maybe some, uh, or they're connected to a medical school in some way. It's expensive to run, uh, but it's interesting stuff, right? But you can also look at where, in, real, in, in almost real time, where oxygen is flowing, where blood is flowing. 
Do you, um, the brain it does a really lousy job of storing sugar and storing, and so if it's going to be active in certain parts of the brain, the blood has to flow there and take oxygen there so and, and take uh, sugars there. And you can use what's called a functional MRI, and it can look at the brain in 3D while it's active. And now we're getting into what part of the brain is doing what activity. And this is known as a bold contrast imaging because you are following blood flow, activation of oxygen. And it can show detail at these little cubes, these little cubes of detail called a voxel. And they can be between one and five millimeters cubed of how things li uh, light up differently. Really great research being done on functional MRIs today and mapping out the brain for language and mapping out the brain for visual information. There's also using MRIs, there's what's called diffusion tensor imaging. And this is tracing the flow and activity of water through white matter. White matter, the long axons with the myelin in them. And they give these images that are really beautiful. And the color of the image is determining where things are pointing. Red points in one direction, green points slightly other, blue points slightly other, purple points in a different direction. So you can see where things are moving. It's a great way of like tracing in some way the whole brain. And it's getting very detailed. Again, these are tracing the flow of water through myelinated axons. And it creates these beautiful images called tractography. And, they, and there's a whole, you can punch that into a Google search or something and you'll see some really beautiful images. There's also what's called positron emission topography. Now, P, PET scans, again, are very expensive. And they are primarily, but not always, used for diagnostic um, means in a medical department because it, you're injecting something. You have to inject something into somebody's bloodstream and then follow where that thing you, in, you injected goes. What you're injecting is a radioactive isotope. You're not injecting uranium. It's not gonna damage tissue unless it's being done over and over very tiny amount of non-harmful radiation, but you have a machine that detects any level of radiation. And so you can look to where this isotope goes and you can couple it. You can attach it to an oxygen molecule. You can attach it to a glucose molecule. You can attach it to a neurotransmitter and follow where it is being taken. Where is sugar going in the brain? So here is a, a PET scan of a brain normal, you can see the red activity is where a lot of sugars and oxygen is going because there's a lot of activity in that area of the brain. Here's somebody with mild cognitive impairment. You begin to see maybe they have a neurodegenerative disease that relates to senility like Alzheimer's and here's somebody with, with Alzheimer's disease and you're just seeing the expansion of this area of blue where there's just not a lot of activity. Not a lot going on there, right? So this is expensive, but this can look at 3D um, aspects of the brain. And people do look use PET scans to look at what areas the brain light up with different components of language. Um, this is kind of a newer scan. It's, I don't know, it's been around a little while, but people don't talk about it much, but it's really kind of interesting. It's called a MEG scan, magnetoencephalography. Try saying that three times fast. And they use a special type of of scan called sensors called squid sensors. I love that. Um, which are uh, need to be cooled down a lot. You have to be in a room that is completely magnetically sh shielded, but it can look at magnetic fields produced by action potentials in the brain. This is like a super sensitive EEG, but it can it can uh, look at where there is activity in the brain by simply measuring the tiniest tiniest magnetic fields generated by action potentials. But it's also very good for looking at real-time uh, brain activity. Now, there's also ways to stimulate the brain and look for changes in behavior. One's called a TDCS, transcranial direct current stimulation. 
And this is where you are running a very low frequency electrical stimulation, this is non-invasive, through the brain. And you're stimulating different parts of the brain and you can look at how it might boost attention, boost cognitive functioning. But it may be a possible treatment for depression. I think there's a lot of work that still needs to be done on this, but I think the early research is showing some promise. There's also a way of kind of shutting down different areas of the brain with transcranial magnetic stimulation. And this is using electromagnetic fields to stimulate, like the electro transcranial direct current stimulation or depress, slow down, keep an area from active, actively working, shut off maybe the activity of one part of the cortex to see if the others, the other kind of uh, takes on a greater role. May also help with depression, uh, may boost functions by dampening one area and looking at the function of other areas. I think these, the TMS and the TDCS are going to be uh, used a lot more in the future. But there's also ways to put electrodes into different parts of the brain, even in the human brain, right? Stereotaxic surgery, we talked about that. But this is not used for uh, experimentation, for ethical reasons, but it might be used to stimulate parts of the brain that are under, under activating or need some stimulation. For example, it may be a way to dampen the activity of, of pain, chronic pain, which is very vital. Researchers have been using it to alleviate depression. You can dial it up and dial it down to help with mood. And then also it can be put into areas of the brain like the subthalamic nucleus or maybe other areas of the basal ganglia to decrease tremors that come about from um, Parkinson's disease. So if, if a person can get access to, the, to what's happening in the physiological body, um, and maybe are things that we don't really recognize, like the slightest twitching of muscles or certain brainwave activity, we can use biofeedback to bring information to that person and then use simple learning mechanisms of reward and punishment to increase or decrease activity. For example, this method is called biofeedback. And somebody could, if you stop right now, can you change your heart rate? Can you lift it up or, or, or lower a heartbeat? Probably not. But if you were looking at a monitor and every time your heart elevated, uh, there was something came on the monitor tell, that told you you did, you did well. That's good, good, good. Or every time it lowers, you get bad, bad, bad. Through this feedback of reward systems, you can learn to control your heartbeat. It's the same with brain waves, skin temperature, muscle activity. Oftentimes biofeedback is used with people with paralysis to learn how to reuse their muscles. It might be a way to reduce muscle activity in the forehead, to reduce uh, headaches. So biofeedback is a psychophysiology technique that detects brainwave activity or muscle activity or, or temperature on your body and gives you feedback that acts in associative learning to reward or punish. I'm not talking painful punish. I'm just telling you this is something that tells you when you're doing things right and doing things wrong to help you manipulate this. I took a biofeedback class in college and one of the things I learned to do is I went into a, a room, I put an EEG on my head and it would tell me with this ping sound every time I was in alpha waves, right? Alpha wave, brain waves are supposed to be relaxing, it's a way of meditation. So this machine would go bing, bing, bing every time I was in alpha and it would go burr, 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 this kind of obnoxious sound every time I was in beta. Well, I'd go into this lab once a week for an hour, and by the end of the semester, I'd go in there and I'd spend most of my time in alpha. It was tr in training me. Recording physiology and using reinforcement principles to modify and change. So it's not only good for relaxation, so it's not only good for relaxation and reducing headaches, but people are using this to control computers in what's called 
brain computer interface or brain machine interface by using muscle activity of the face or brainwave signals to manipulate objects on a computer screen. We tried this stuff out in my lab for a while, and it's difficult to use, but I think they're getting better at it. So this, this stuff we use was from a company called Emotive. There's also a company called NeuroSky. There's several of these. Here's what my, my students did. They put this, elect, this EEG cap on that measured at different points in, on the skull, different points of the cortex, measured them. And this is the idea. This object would be on the computer screen. And when this object moved to the right, it would record. It would be in record mode and record everything that's happening in your brain. And it would create sort of this stamp. Like when an object's moving to the right, their brain does this. And then the object would sit there and it would float. It would just float. And they would think. And they would think about moving it to the right and moving it to the right. And every once in a while the brain activity would match what they had recorded as move an object to the right and this and the little object would move to the right and then back again and through the sort of when it moved to the right you were rewarded you're how happy your brain is trying to do this thing where it goes well i just did something right try to do that again try to do that again and over the course of several hours students could look at that and move it to the right fairly well. It was difficult. You know, it was it was a difficult thing for them to learn how to do. But remember, the brain is crazy. It's it's going through all these crazy brain waves. And then we you could do these different things like you could if you got good at pr putting it to the right, you could also train it to go up or to the right. So you thought about it, go up, you thought about it, go right. That's the brain computer interface. Again, I don't think this technology is at a point where you're controlling a um, an avatar and a computer running around and, and playing games with your brain waves yet, um, mainly because these brain waves are, are noisy. There's just so much going on, and there's a lot of variability in what's happening, and, and the recording, the, what called impedance of recording, can be very difficult. Still kind of fun. I still think this is going to be great stuff as we get better and better. Now, there's also brain machine interface, moving objects with your with your um, brain waves, such as moving robots or other things like that. People have been doing that for a while in the same mechanism of biofeedback and brain waves. But to get rid of that impedance, to be more accurate, some people have an electrode inserted in surgically inserted onto the motor cortex. And they, that, that's, that has less interference, and people can use that to move uh, robot arms. Now, you're not going to do that with a college student who's coming in for a participation in a lab, but maybe somebody like this individual who's lost the control of their hands because of a paralysis of some sort, they learn through biofeedback to move objects like a, like a, um, a, a robotic arm. Like she is able to take this robotic arm and bring the arm close to her and take a drink from it. Still, it's difficult stuff. There's a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of practice. This is a company called BrainGate. And I have a feeling you're going to see these more, this sort of interconnection between computers, machines, and the nervous system. It's going to be an interesting uh, next 20 years in terms of how they connect and, and what people are able to do. Okay, that's the end of the lecture on methods, uh, neurohistology, imaging techniques. I hope you liked it, and I hope you learned a lot.